In this question, we have two spheres, sphere one and sphere two, and they are connected with a wire that is thin enough to retain only negligible charge. Because they are connected by a wire, we can treat the spheres as a single conductor. We know that when an excess of charge is placed on such a conductor, the charge will distribute itself on the surface of that conductor so that all points of the conductor come to the same potential. So in part A, when they ask us is potential V1 of sphere one greater than, less than, or equal to the potential V2 of sphere two, the answer will be that they are equal according to the theorem that we just highlighted previously. So again, they're connected by a wire. You can treat them as a single conductor. The charge on that single conductor will distribute itself in such a way so that all points of the conductor will come to the same potential. So the answer to, again to part A is that the potentials will be equal. Now in parts B and C, we need to understand that because we're determining the potential at a point that lies outside of the sphere, we can treat the sphere as a point particle. And so we know that the potential of a point particle is given by K which is a Coulomb's constant multiplied by the charge divided by a distance. So for sphere one, we can say that V1 is equal to K times Q1, which would be the charge on sphere one, divided by R1. And then for sphere two, similarly, we can say V2 equals K times Q2 divided by R2. Now, we also know that sphere two's radius was represented as 2r1. So in fact, this radius right here for sphere two can be substituted with 2r1. So we'll make that substitution. So here's an equation that we're gonna be using for sphere two, and this is the equation we're gonna be using for sphere one. We note that initially, the amount of charge on sphere one was represented by just Q, and then once the spheres were connected, that charge distributed itself amongst the two spheres. So what this means is that the total charge is still equal to that symbol Q. In other words, the charge on sphere one after they're connected plus the charge on sphere two after they're connected will still equal the total charge that was initially present on sphere one. Now we stated earlier that these two potentials are going to be equal to one another. That was our conclusion in part A. And since they are equal to one another, we can set this expression for V1 equal to this expression for V2. So let's go ahead and do so. And then after doing that, we're going to be able to simplify this in a couple of ways. We can see, of course, that K appears on both sides of the equation. So we can divide both sides by K. Similarly, we can multiply both sides by R1, and that will cancel out the R1s. So we're left with a simplified equation here. We have Q1 is equal to Q2 over 2. So this equation along with this equation is going to be very useful to us. Let's go back and figure out what we wanted in part B. It said what fraction of Q ends up on sphere 1. So what they're really asking for in part B is Q1 divided by Q. That's the nature of the question in part B, the fraction of the charge that's on sphere 1. And so we have to combine the two equations that we have starred here. Why don't we multiply both sides of this equation by 2? So then these twos cancel out and we can see that Q2 is equal to two times Q1. We can then make a little substitution here. We could substitute two Q1 in for Q2 of the first start equation. So we would have Q1 plus two Q1 is equal to Q. We can combine the like terms. We would have three Q1 is equal to Q. We could then divide both sides of this equation by Q. So now we have three Q1 over Q is equal to one. And then finally multiply both sides by one third. These threes would cancel and we get the correct answer to part B. So Q1 divided by Q is equal to one third. 
Now in part C, we're being asked what fraction of the charge Q ends up on sphere two. So we're basically being asked for Q2 divided by Q. We can take the two equations that we start earlier and again, just algebraically manipulate them. Why don't we plug Q2 divided by two in for Q1? So we then have the following equation, Q2 over two plus Q2 is equal to Q. We might multiply bo uh, both sides of the equation by two. So basically that means we'll multiply each term of the equation by two. These twos cancel. So now we have Q2 plus two Q2 is equal to two Q. The left side, if we add the like terms, becomes three Q2 equals two Q. We could divide both sides by Q. So then we have three Q2 over Q is equal to two. And finally, we'd multiply both sides by one third. So these threes would cancel. And we have the correct answer to part C, Q2 divided by Q is equal to two thirds. So that would be the fraction of the charge Q that ends up on sphere two. We can finally move on to part D here. And in part D, we are asked for the ratio sigma one over sigma two of the surface charge densities. Now, the surface charge density of sphere one would be the amount of charge on sphere one divided by its surface area. The surface area of a sphere is four pi times the radius squared. And then similarly, sigma two would be the charge on sphere two divided by four pi times its radius squared. We want the ratio of these two, so we could actually divide the two equations. We would then have sigma one over sigma two equals Q1 over four pi R1 squared. Now you're dividing by this fraction here, but when you divide by a fraction, you can actually multiply by its reciprocal. So this becomes a more convenient way to write it out. Continuing to simplify, we can cancel the four pi's. And now if we look carefully, we've got, we can arrange this in a certain way. We can put Q1 over Q2 a lot of little algebraic maneuvering here, and then multiply that by R2 over R1, but then they're both squared. So you can write that as R2 over R1, all of which is squared. We developed some answers to these earlier. We know Q1 was one third Q, Q2 was two thirds Q, R2 was two times R1, and R1 was just R1. These are ones cancel out, the Q's cancel out. So now you have one third divided by two thirds. Heck, these threes cancel out. So you really have one over two times two squared, which is one half times four, which is two. So this would be the correct answer to part D.